So first important philosophical question, would you rather have your intro music be the Top Gun theme song or epic battleship music? Honestly, the uh, Top Gun references are punishable by a $5 fine. Uh, generally, so no Top Gun references are allowed unless you want to pay a hefty, hefty sum. Uh, I am honored to introduce Mason Tai. Uh, Mason is a major in the United States Air Force. He's currently an instructor pilot on the E3 Century. He was formerly an instructor pilot in the uh, EC-130H Compass Call. He has over 2,500 flight hours and over 800 combat hours. He has seven air medals and nearly 160 combat missions flown. Uh, he also has a master's degree in international security and can consistently wreck me at both chess and Age of Empires. Mason, thanks for joining. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on. So uh, I assigned the uh, uh, article by Admiral Stockdale, Courage Under Fire, uh, and then I found out that not only do you know about this person, but you've heard about, uh, you've heard firsthand from the, the people who were with him and who were prisoners of war in Vietnam. Uh, what was it like hearing from those people? So the context from uh, about hearing from the people who have spoken in that article, uh, you know, in that article, and the people who have gone through that, is that that portion of time is the most significant POW experience from a truly, truly hostile power that wasn't willing to respect Geneva Convention protocols um, and such that the United States has. So it's the greatest body of POW experience that we have for the longest period of time. So it's referenced pretty heavily when they're training um, conduct after capture, uh, survival training, and uh, more importantly to the broader force, I guess, it's brought up in our professional military education um, as people adhering to some of the core values that the military likes to espouse and likes to build as the core culture, if you will, uh, for how to behave in a situation that we were being put under undue stress um, in ways that you know are mind-boggling, frightening, and really horrible to hear about, uh, specifically prisoner of war scenarios where you're being tortured. So during our professional military education, there's a particular speaker that likes to come. Uh, he uh, would Come and he will talk for about two hours uh, to a body of officers, all captains, uh, and people will ask questions during that time. He will recount his experiences. He'll recount being tortured, and uh, he'll recount, uh, you know, returning um, from that experience and, and everything that, that went along with that. So you get kind of a chronological view um, of what happened, and he's willing to talk about the nitty gritty details of what they went through on a day-to-day -day basis and the things that brought them through it. Uh, things that they revisit a lot during that and talking about that is the idea that you're going to make mistakes, you're going to fail, you're going to break. You will. People are able to break you. If you've ever had a scenario where someone is controlling every aspect of your life, when you eat, when you sleep, what you feel, uh, the conditions that you're laying in, just every bit of it, you soon realize that they can really, really, really get inside your head the smallest things. Um, and it becomes a, a very big mental struggle uh, to stay in the game, whatever you want to say it is, to resist in any way once someone has that absolute control over you. Anybody who's been in prison um, can probably attest to that. And this is prison on steroids, right? No holds barred, torture, and they've got political aims that they're trying to extract. So one of the things which is uh, most striking about that article is he, uh, Stockdale says that the, the torture isn't actually the worst harm that happens to you. Uh, so in the experiences that they had, the, you think that the torture is going to be the worst thing, but it's actually not. And they give kind of a surprising answer. So could you say more about, like, so looking back on those experiences, what was it that you know, really stuck with them? Um, because, you know, just to give it some ancient context, Aristotle says that it's ridiculous to think that you could have a good life if you've been tortured. 
And the Stoics disagree. The Stoics think there are worse things that can happen to you than, than being tortured. So could you say a little bit more about, about um, how that kind of aspect and like what stuck with these people um, after they'd been released? Absolutely. So uh, what the military learned from this period is that they need to teach people to do the right thing uh, to the utmost of, of their abilities in these scenarios, right? Huge amount of stress, huge amount of pressure, torture, you're being physically abused. And the teachings now are that you, uh, you need to behave honorably. Okay? So what does that actually mean, behaving honorably? It means you're going to fail. Like I said, you will break. And they talked about that bouncing back. So what was the worst thing about that torture? Torture you could have happened to you, and it was terrible in the moment, but you would usually heal from it, right? But the people involved in that would feel an immense amount of shame. They would go back to the people that they were imprisoned with, uh, the, the fellow Americans, and they felt shame. If you go back, you can look at an interview with uh, John McCain, who was a prisoner of war, obviously, and he spoke, he spoke about how he felt he had betrayed America despite the fact that they were under, of course, intense mental physical duress to make statements that were you know, treasonous or to sign things or to make propaganda videos. And it was that shame, that shame of going back to among their fellow prisoners, to going back among their fellow countrymen and feeling like they had done something wrong, that they had broken, right? So the military gives that boilerplate answer. You can give your name, rank, date of birth, serial number, right? It's not gonna. It's not gonna cut it. It's not gonna get you out of torture or anything like that. And you're going to have to say more, and you're going to have to pick up your feet. And there's times you're going to fail. And that, and that bouncing back is a two-way street. You know, they teach the broader community that when somebody fails, they fail. That you have to re-embrace them, bring them back into the fold, and you have to re-establish that they are respected, that they are part of the fights that you don't judge them for that failure that they just have, that they're just suffering from. Um, probably, you know, they're really emotionally hurt and brought lower by that, which allows them to be exploited more in a prisoner of war scenario. So something that the Stoics make a big deal out of is they say that your life really consists of how you respond to your circumstances as opposed to the circumstances that you find yourself in. Do you think that that theme kind of comes out in what they're saying, where what you really identify with is how you respond to the situation as opposed to what, what happens to you? So the way in which it's, it's somehow easier to dissociate yourself, even though you were the one who was being, being tortured? Right. That goes back to the things you can control and the things you can't control, right? We talk about that a lot. Uh, you, you talk about the area of influence that you actually have as a prisoner in this case. Um, or in any situation, right? You can only operate in that very narrow confine. You have to do the best course of action in that narrow confine. And that is where, you know, behaving honorably comes from. They could leave you uh, a physical mess. You could be in a cell with, you know, human feces around and, and just horrible conditions. You are physically degraded to the point where you do not look honorable. You are brought low, but you behaved honorably in the areas that you actually had control, and that's where you fight your fight, and that's where you get your worth out of it, and that's where you return with honor, and you come back, and you can hold your head high, and the military really likes to push that idea, just controlling the area that you can control. So one of the areas that the, the Stoics think that we can always control, as they say, we can always control our emotional responses. We can always control our judgments. And insofar as our emotions are, are based in judgments, we can always control our emotions. And they jump to military combat examples a lot to kind of demonstrate this point that even in the heat of battle, you're able to control your emotions. Um, and so if people in those extreme situations can do it, then we in ordinary situations can now. Uh, what are some ways in which you've been taught um, or that you've learned to control your emotions and stay rational in you know, emergency situations or really high pressure situations? So I think that in the ideal world, the Stoics uh, view on that might be true. I think there are going to be situations that can pull you out of it. 
conduct after capture situation or, or in the airplane, for example, um, falling back on training is, uh, is emphasized. So uh, in the aircraft, if we have an emergency, you lose an engine, they teach you to literally hack the clock, start the clock and uh, start thinking so that you don't do anything rash, don't do anything quickly because you need to aviate, you need to navigate, and then you need to handle that emergency. You don't need to rush because rushing is often what's going to actually get you killed or back you into a corner that's um, going to be unrecoverable and you're going to either have to eject or you're going to end up you know, putting that thing into the dirt somewhere, um, hopefully controlled. Uh, so there's training that you can fall back on, but uh, as far as the Stoics saying you always can, I'm not sure that's true. And I think there needs to be some flex and some bend for humanity. And that's where you get that idea of people seeking redemption or uh, as a community accepting that uh, redemption is going to be something that you're going to have to offer. Um, so maybe in a perfect world, you, you'd see that play out perfectly, but uh, we are human. And I think we have to accept that there has to be some flex and some bend in the, in the actual application. The idea that we're always going to be able to control our thoughts, always going to be able to control our emotions. Nice. So, just so when you say hacking the clock, what does that? What is actually involved in that? So, and like, I I just don't understand what that means. So, what does at a very like practical level, what does it involve? Okay, it's, a, it's a little jargony, but it literally means to start a clock. We have a clock in every cockpit, and uh, be it a fighter jet, be it a big plane, uh, be it a, one of our little trainers. This clock, and it's the same clock. Uh, and you, you start it, you start that time ticking. And it's just a way for you to pause and pull out of uh, the idea that I need to do something immediately. There's rarely situations where you need to do something immediately. And in those situations, uh, it's something called bold face. We have a rope memorization, brakes maximum, throttles idle, speed brakes up. And it's for a scenario where I have to do that immediately. So every month we have to take a test where we write that down verbatim, punctuation and everything. And that training is instilled very, very, very deeply for those immediate actions. But anything else, it's going to be reaching over, hitting the clock and pausing, thinking, and controlling those emotions and taking the most rational response. That's really cool. So, uh, I mean, you were saying that obviously there are going to be situations in which people aren't able to live up to the standards and, Live up even to the training that that you get. What are some ways that the military has taught you to kind of uh, rein people in when it looks like uh, starting to lose control or that uh, starting to potentially be be a risk? What are some ways in which you can kind of get them back on board? Um, sometimes you have to, especially when managing a crew, uh, people's emotions can flare up either between each other or they can freeze up. Teaching younger pilots, they'll often freeze because they are scared of a situation animal brain kind of takes over and it's fight or flight. You know, you've heard it in many different ways. Uh, the way that you bring people back to the problem at hand is you can verbally recage them. Uh, you can use your legitimate authority, authority as either an aircraft commander or an instructor pilot to uh, bring them back to the problem or have them fall back on that training that you expect. And then again, that legitimate authority, which you see in the military structures a lot, as an aircraft commander is absolute. If you decide something, uh, your word is is law in the in the end, and it's uh, it's written into the book in many different places. And you will, you know, if you make the wrong decision, you'll face the consequences later. But you are endowed with that legitimate authority by the organization, and all the training, all the military training that they go through initially, kind of leads them to accept that very hierarchical structure which is some of the tools that we use to, to bring people maybe back into compliance uh, with the book and the regulations and things like that. It's not always the best answer, mind you. They are human. Sometimes an emotional appeal is going to do better, but on a tactical scenario, when it's, when it's actually flying the aircraft, um, an appeal to authority, appeal to the regulation, that's what you really want to use. So, ending with the big question. Do you think it's possible to have a good life when really bad things happen to you? Absolutely, right? So would you be the person you are today if you hadn't had the hardships that you might have had? It's pretty doubtful, I think. And, and there's and suffering happens. We're not always on vacation. 
you got to put in work. Whatever that work is, is, is a relative thing uh, for, for various people. There's people in, you know, that are watching this class that are in a much better economic state and, uh, than other people. But a lot of us are a lot worse off than other people. So it, it's all relative and, and you can find enjoyment and, and you can find a happy life and fulfillment even if you do go through some, some bad times. And I think the prisoners of war that came back and I asked him, I asked him, what was the first meal you had when you get back, when you got back? And he said, the first meal I had was bacon, eggs, and toast. And he said that that, you know, had, he still remembers it because it had been that long since he had had such a small, small pleasure. So you just gotta, you gotta take the good stuff where you can get it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mason. And as always, thank you for your service. Uh, really appreciate it. And we appreciate you taking the time out. Good job. Thanks, Jeremy. I'll see you in San Francisco, buddy.